Love is often mistakenly equated with possession, while vitality and appeal are misconstrued as bad temper. Unfortunately, under certain circumstances, such misconceptions can lead to tragic outcomes, as was the case in the lives of the main characters of our story today. On Monday, July 3, 2012, in the peaceful small town of Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, USA, carding mechanics with immense dedication were busy preparing their cars in their garages, while Frank Spencer's friend Joe had been unable to get in touch with his buddy since the start of the weekend. At this point, their team was halfway to a coveted victory in the racing series, and they had every chance of success. However, after recent competitions, problems began to arise with the cars and Joe urgently needed advice. Therefore, he decided to head over to Frank's house since he wasn't answering calls and his mobile was turned off. On his way, Joe half-jokingly thought he hoped not to find his friend dead, yet had a grim premonition. Upon arriving in his car, Joe immediately felt alarm. The front door was ajar and bloody traces were visible at the doorstep. Joe's worst fears were confirmed. Inside, his best friend, Eraser, lay on the floor lifeless. This once vibrant person now seemed as peaceful as never before. For a moment, John was paralyzed by shock, unable to even move, just staring silently at his friend with the heavy realization that he would never be able to exchange a handshake with him again. An observer circled the body and noticed dried blood spilled from a bullet wound near the ear. Then the man dialed the emergency service number 911, reporting the horrific find. His friend had been murdered. He was certain of the culprit's identity. In 1997, Frank Spencer and his beloved Maria were passionately in love with each other. Their parents, disapproving of the relationship, tried to intervene for a long time, but the lovers did not relent. Eventually, they took decisive action, ran away from home and rented an apartment, seeking to escape the family scrutiny. Over time, their romance was accepted by relatives who realized that further objections would only worsen the situation and risk losing touch with the young couple. Marie and Frank soon got married, and they first had a son, then a daughter. After that, the young family moved into their own house, starting to create a cozy place for living. Frank worked tirelessly, striving to provide for his family with everything needed, working for the welfare of his loved ones, building a career, and developing his own business. These same values were passed down from generation to generation. Frank's father had managed his own business for many years, and upon retiring, passed the baton to his son, who proudly took on the responsibility of continuing the family business. Frank's friends noted that Maria exhibited a cool attitude towards family values and married life. In fact, her interest in the children was minimal. She seemed preoccupied with herself and rarely devoted time to domestic duties. Her primary interest was finances. Maria loved to spend money, which became one of the reasons for tension in the family. This, along with her almost complete indifference to raising the children, gradually led to the dissolution of the marriage. In 2006, the couple decided to divorce, with the initiative coming from Frank, who was tired of the endless arguments and emotional outbursts from his wife. Her behavior was so unstable that Frank seriously feared for the well-being of the children. The situation escalated after the decision to divorce, spawning even sharper conflicts. Frank insisted that the children stay with him, confident that Maria could not provide proper care for them. However, there were people in his circle who disagreed with his stance. His friend Ron believed it was important for the children to maintain connections with both parents and called for a compromise regarding custody, suggesting it be shared between the ex-spouses. Frank did not object to the children's meetings with their mother, but aimed to protect them from her short-sightedness and the potential threat she posed. Nonetheless, contrary to the wishes of her ex-husband, Maria sought sole custody of the children hoping to secure significant alimony since she was unwilling to work. Due to issues related to the divorce and custody rights, fierce disputes often arose between Frank and Maria. These disagreements turned into constant clashes, especially when discussing the division of custody rights. Frank repeatedly resorted to calling the police to his home due to Maria's uncontrollable behavior, which manifested as aggression towards him and their children. In one incident in 2008, Maria was even arrested after instigating a fight with her former mother-in-law at one of the children's schools. Maria came to pick up her daughter, contrary to an agreement with her former mother-in-law, leading to a physical conflict. 
After the altercation, Maria drove away with her daughter in her car, forgetting to buckle her up. This fact was noticed by patrol officers, leading to legal troubles for Maria. She was charged with hooliganism, and moreover, Frank accused her of stalking. Despite Frank's confidence in the threat to their children's safety, the prosecutor, according to him, lacks sufficient evidence and witness statements to support these charges. Eventually, Maria was offered a plea deal. She admitted her guilt in hooliganism and stalking, but charges of creating a threat to her daughter's life were dropped. As a result, Maria was fined $600 for her misdemeanors. However, the punishment received did not lead the irresponsible mother to reconsider her actions. On the contrary, Maria became even more aggressive, especially towards her ex-husband. Since then, Frank's circle, including his friends and relatives, began to hear his complaints more frequently. He made revelations about Maria threatening and stalking him, unashamed in the presence of others. The situation escalated to such an extent that there were numerous witnesses who could confirm his words based on their own observations. Frank tried to maintain composure, aiming to resolve the conflict and meticulously recorded all incidents to later present them as evidence to the police. He sought to resolve all issues as, in his opinion, Maria clearly did not know the limits of her actions. By 2009, the divorce process had not yet been finalized, despite three years having passed since the start of the divorce proceedings. Throughout this time, the children lived with their mother, but despite the problems with his ex-wife, Frank decided to move forward. During this period, he met a woman named Julie Den, whom he encountered through mutual friends, and soon serious relations developed between them. When Maria learned about Frank's new romance, the situation worsened. According to her claims, she was indifferent to Julie spending time with Frank, but the idea of another woman interacting with her children triggered a violent and painful reaction in her. Frank was convinced that Maria's accusations were baseless, as Julie always showed exceptional kindness to his children, behaving much warmer than their biological mother. He believed that the true reason behind her aggressive outbursts was jealousy, which only exacerbated the tension in the relationship with his ex-wife. The situation was further complicated by the release of Anthony Roca Franklin, Maria's father, whose five-year sentence for fraud was coming to an end. For Frank, Roca's return to freedom was an extremely unwelcome turn of events, given his reputation as a particularly dangerous and aggressive man with a difficult character, traits many believed Maria had inherited. During this period, Frank's increased anxiety seemed almost paranoid, but not without reason. A few months after Roca's release, criminals broke into the office of the company Frank managed. Although they did not take any valuable property, documents crucial for Maria in her pursuit of alimony disappeared from his personal office. She intended to use his business records to expose possible violations. At dawn following the incident, Frank received an unexpected call from Maria. Her message seemed absurd. She claimed to have found a package with his documents on her doorstep, lying there since the morning. No connection to the break-in and theft at Frank's office could be established. According to police statements, no traces that could point to a perpetrator were found. Nevertheless, Frank's friends and relatives were convinced that only two people were behind the action, his ex-wife Maria and her father Roca, who had recently been released from prison. During the investigation, detectives questioned Maria as the main suspect, but failed to find evidence of her guilt. Ultimately, due to a lack of convincing evidence, the investigation was suspended. Despite this, due to pressure from law enforcement, Maria decided to hand over the found documents to her lawyer who, in turn, deemed it necessary to return them to the owner. Presumably, Maria and her legal representative found no incriminating information in the documents that could be used against Frank. This incident remained unsolved and continues to raise questions for many, as it was clear that the crime was committed with someone's involvement. The lack of punishment for the culprits only contributed to the intensification of aggressive tendencies among those they encountered, creating an even more tense atmosphere. Following these events, Frank faced threats on the internet, regularly coming from his ex-wife. She repeatedly expressed her outrage through social media regarding the relationship of his new partner with their mutual children, displaying excessive jealousy and concerns for the children's welfare in Julie's presence. 
These online disputes continued until the winter of 2010. At this point, seemingly having reached his limit of patience, Frank turned to the police reporting the threats he had received and providing the exchange of messages with his ex-wife so that law enforcement could independently assess Maria's behavior. She, in turn, claimed that her words were misinterpreted, asserting that she meant no threat, and her messages were merely the result of an emotional outburst and loss of composure during arguments with Frank. Consequently, her words should not have been interpreted as threats, considering that the text was written in a mild form, making it impossible to prove her guilt. While Frank and his partner Julie were planning a charming Caribbean trip in January 2011, Maria, upon learning of their intentions, began to actively interfere, bombarding Julie with messages and calls. She tried to convince her that Frank still felt attached to her and that romantic relations between them had not ceased even after the divorce. Maria orchestrated a fake meeting to confrontationally communicate with Julie, hoping to destroy their relationship. All of Julie's attempts to clarify to Maria that they wanted to be left alone were unsuccessful, and the situation worsened. One night, Frank's house became the site of a tragedy due to a fire outbreak. Neighbors and friends seeing the flames immediately rushed to the site, fearing Frank might be inside. Everyone was convinced of his demise, as the house was supposed to be safe and quiet at that time. Meanwhile, Maria, having arrived at the scene, watched the fire with undisguised joy and then silently drove away without uttering a word. Fortunately for Frank, he was not in the house at the time of the fire. However, a dog belonging to one of the children of the estranged spouses perished in the fire, becoming the sole victim of the sad event. Frank again sought help from law enforcement, insisting that his ex-wife was behind the fire. He was seriously concerned, believing that the incident posed a real danger to both himself and his loved ones, given that his ex-wife had moved from threats to real actions. Despite his fears and previous appeals, law enforcement remained at their stance. There was insufficient evidence of arson, as it had been destroyed by the fire. Thus, the incident was recorded as an accident, adding yet another unresolved case to the Spencer dossier. To Frank's surprise, he was unable to secure protection from his ex-wife's harassment through police support, despite clear indications of her involvement. It felt as though local law enforcement might not be sufficiently interested in resolving his issue or even in collusion. However, one officer tried to initiate a criminal case and interview Marie as the main suspect. But since the fire department had already ruled the incident as accidental, any further attempts at investigation were blocked. Nonetheless, this officer continued to assert that the arson could not have been accidental, especially considering the prolonged conflict between Frank and his ex-wife. In response to the incident, Maria sent Frank a series of text messages in which she sarcastically and mockingly referred to what had happened, blaming him for ruining her life and calling the events well-deserved karma. She also expanded her threats, sending similar messages to Julie, warning that she would be the next target. Despite this, the police did not see her actions as grounds for charges, which only emboldened her and convinced her of her own impunity, prompting her to make open threats to both Frank and his new partner. Maria apparently did not intend to stop at words alone. Sometime after her messages, Julie's house was engulfed in flames. At that moment, Julie was at home and was forced to jump from the roof of her porch to escape. Although Julie did not sustain serious injuries, her property was destroyed by the fire and she was left homeless. The parallels between this event and the arson of Frank's house were obvious to both, especially considering that Julie's house was not completely destroyed but became uninhabitable. Frank and Julie hoped that evidence indicating arson would be found at the site of the fire. They also counted on closer police attention as the house was located in a different county. However, their expectations were not met. Even after extensive interaction with the victims, law enforcement found no sufficient grounds for investigation, declaring the fire an accidental event. Julie had to appeal to higher authorities to initiate a proper investigation by the police, which ultimately gave the case some momentum. As a result of intensified efforts, pyrotechnic elements likely used for arson were discovered in her garden. Among the foliage, one damaged specimen was found, and then a second, which most likely served as the source of ignition. Additionally, traces of gasoline were found on the steps leading to the house, 
strengthening suspicions of deliberate arson. After prolonged debates, authorities concluded that the fire was the result of intentional actions. Nevertheless, the investigation reached an impasse and the perpetrator was not identified. Both Frank and Julie unhesitatingly pointed to Maria, who had been pursuing her ex-husband for a long time. Moreover, just before the incident, she had clearly made threats related to fire. With the start of Frank's new relationship, Maria intensified her attempts at interference and threats, which became even more aggressive after her father's release from prison, creating the impression that they were acting together. Despite these circumstances and clear signs of stalking, police were unable to bring charges due to alleged lack of evidence. The situation continued to escalate, so by the summer of 2012, Frank and Julie decided to temporarily separate, hoping to mislead Mariah and give her time to calm down. To lend their actions more credibility, the couple even published their story in the local press, coincidentally aligning with the conclusion of their divorce process. Unexpectedly, just a day after the publication, Frank was found lifeless. Relatives and close ones immediately suspected the ex-wife of involvement in Frank's death, considering that the divorce had been finalized just a day before the tragedy, and Maria had repeatedly expressed her displeasure with the breakup. Maria initially opposed the divorce, and their separation case turned out to be extremely complicated and protracted, with constant conflicts at every interaction. Ironically, it was Maria's bright and fiery nature that once attracted Frank, who himself possessed incredible energy and temperament, finding in her a reflection of himself. Initially, their union was a continuous complement to each other. However, over time, passions led to exhaustion and discord in the relationship. Yet the question remains, could these challenging relationships have reached a point where one of the partners resorted to extreme measures? Unraveling this mystery was up to the investigator. Upon arriving at the scene, law enforcement officers discovered extensive pools of blood in the deceased's home, surrounded by smudged tracks, indicating attempts to erase evidence. Among the evidence found was a clear shoe print on the floor, which according to forensic analysis, matched the shoes typically worn by Maria's father. In the center of the kitchen on the floor, one yellow rubber glove was found and another in the sink. DNA analysis of these gloves revealed the presence of Maria's skin particles, although friends of the deceased insisted she had not lived in the house for over a year, excluding the accidental presence of the gloves in the home. This evidence testified to the recent use of the gloves and pointed to a direct connection of both Maria and her father to the crime. Both suspects were arrested. The entire town was convinced that they were behind the brutal vendetta against Frank, aiming to see him dead. The long history of Maria's harassment, turning her ex-husband's life into a nightmare, and the arsons, which the locals also attributed to Maria and her father, only confirmed this theory. However, for the official presentation of charges, the police required irrefutable evidence, which was soon provided by the results of laboratory analyses and the conclusion of forensic experts. Frank died from injuries sustained from shots fired from two different types of weapons. According to the forensic medical expert's conclusion, the first shot was made with a shotgun as Frank approached the front door, possibly intending to open it. No traces of gunpowder were found on his clothing, indicating that the shooter was at a relatively long distance. The bullet pierced his arm and entered his chest, severing a critically important artery, leading to a fatal outcome. However, this was not the only injury. The police speculated that after the first shot wounded Frank, he was dragged into the house where the attacker made a control shot with a pistol to the head at close range. The presence of gunshot residue on the body confirmed this. It is believed that by that time, Frank was already dead, and the second shot was made as an expression of rage or revenge, showing deep hatred for the victim. All these details match Maria's profile, indicating that if Frank had not died from the first shot, the subsequent one would certainly have been fatal for him. The police theorized that Maria's father, Roca, was behind the shotgun shot, while his daughter Maria delivered the decisive blow, shooting Frank with a pistol inside the house. This act was the culmination of their joint actions. After Frank was dragged into the house and left on the floor, Maria fired the shot. Detectives also noted the disappearance of Frank's dog and car, which added additional questions to the investigation. As a result, it was decided to check the traffic camera recordings and soon Frank's pickup was spotted on the highway, 
moving away from his home shortly after his death. Unfortunately, the quality of the recordings was not good enough to identify the driver. Ultimately, Frank's car was found in Sunbury, Pennsylvania, about 25 miles from his home near Maria's apartment. Sometime later, Frank's dog, which had been acquired to replace a pet that perished in a fire, was also found. It is believed that the dog ran away, frightened by the gunshots, but its presence far from Frank's home raised suspicions. The disappearance of the animal was reported by the Spencer family, which by that time had gained a notorious reputation due to a high-profile court case and the harassments that became well-known throughout the town, except to the police. Investigators theorized that Maria intended to take the dog for her children, but the animal escaped when Roca was transporting it in the stolen car. During Roca's interrogation, they attempted to determine the origin of his shoe prints in Frank's house, but the man preferred to concoct an unbelievable story about his supposed visit to Frank the day before the tragedy. Roca claimed that, despite the strained relationship between his daughter and Frank, he got along with Frank and had come to help him with cleaning, during which he accidentally left a mark on one of the already present bloodstains on the floor. However, Roca could not explain the presence of blood in the house, and his statements about friendship with Frank found no confirmation. None of the witnesses could attest to their good relationship, and the claims of friendship seemed unlikely. Additionally, Roca claimed he did not steal Frank's car, stating that Frank himself had offered him to use the car, as he was supposedly planning to sell it. This twist in Rocca's story seemed even more far-fetched, given the circumstances of their relationship and subsequent events. Rocca claimed he took Frank's car a day before his death, supposedly coming to assist his former son-in-law. With this strange explanation, he tried to justify the potential discovery of his fingerprints or DNA on items in the deceased's home, essentially admitting his presence at the crime scene, but trying to alter the chronology of events. The police still lacked more concrete evidence for charges, such as the murder weapon. However, Roca, being an experienced criminal, likely knew how to dispose of a firearm. A search of his home revealed neither the shotgun nor the pistol, and due to his probation terms, Roca had no right to own weapons, and Maria also did not have any registered weapons. But Roca's connections in the criminal world could have allowed him to easily acquire a weapon for killing Frank. Maria categorically denied her guilt, claiming the gloves ended up in Frank's house by accident and rejecting any involvement in the crime. Despite the absurdity of the provided explanations, the suspects were temporarily released, although the investigation continued to gather evidence against them. Maria continued to lead a normal life, attending, for example, her son's football match. During one such visit, a friend of Frank's tried to inquire about her possible involvement in the incident. Maria quickly realized his intention and gave evasive answers. Nonetheless, from her words, it could be inferred that she was present at the crime scene and witnessed Frank's death but was not his murderer. The state attorney general's office was drawn to the local authorities' indifference to Frank's accusations against his ex-wife. All his complaints were ignored, even though state law considers even indirect death threats as a serious crime, and acts of arson as attempts at murder. Despite clear evidence, investigators took no steps to begin a full investigation into any of Frank's complaints, leaving the reasons for such inaction unclear to the prosecution. As a result of numerous accusations against the police regarding their inability and indifference to conduct investigations, an internal investigation was initiated. There were many complaints about detectives ignoring statements and justifying their stance with the lack of concrete evidence of threats. According to their claims, Frank supposedly did not provide any threats in the form of voice messages or textual evidence of stalking. Attempts to prove the investigator's negligent attitude toward the case were unsuccessful as nothing was properly documented and the only witness who could confirm or refute these claims was already dead. Public and Frank's family's dissatisfaction grew, yet numerous complaints remained unanswered and the investigation once again reached a dead end. This time, the halt was due to the detective's desire to charge the criminals, not only with stalking and murder, but also with other legal violations committed before Frank's death. In 2013, a comprehensive interrogation was scheduled, and both suspects, Maria and Roca, finally agreed to speak with the police. Nonetheless, they denied their guilt on all 12 counts of charges. 
This led to additional charges of giving false statements. The main charge concerned the premeditated murder of Frank. The prosecution argued that the criminals arrived at the scene together, preferring not to use transportation to avoid attracting unnecessary attention. After shooting the defenseless victim, they fled in his car. During the investigation, both were placed under house arrest. But by the end of 2014, Maria was taken into custody. Rocca, in turn, managed to flee, flying to Colombia immediately after giving his statement. His escape to South America was interpreted by the prosecution as an attempt to evade justice and an indirect admission of guilt. For 11 months, Rocca hid until he was arrested near the U.S. Embassy in Buenos Aires, Argentina. After a brief fight against extradition, he was extradited back to his home country. In the fall of 2015, Maria stood trial for the murder of her ex-husband, continuing to deny her guilt and shifting it to her father. Prosecution witnesses detailed the threats and arsons committed by Maria. The trial lasted nine days after which the jury found her guilty on all charges, including murder, arson, burglary, giving false statements, conspiracy, and threats. Maria was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, plus an additional 50 years. As a result, Maria remained behind bars forever. In 2017, Roca, after attempting to hide abroad, also stood trial late but inevitably facing justice. Roca was clearly disappointed by his daughter's attempt to shift the blame onto him. He claimed he was only helping her but was categorically against murder. According to his statements, it was Maria who wished death upon her ex-husband. However, his poorly supported arguments did not convince the prosecution, and his story seemed powerless against compelling evidence. In the fall of 2018, Rocca Franklin was found guilty of crimes against Frank Spencer, including murder, burglary, and arson, like his daughter. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, plus an additional 45 years. Custody of Maria and Frank's children was given to Maria's sister, ensuring they were provided with protection and care after the tragedy that shattered their family.